You're watching the Spirit Food Christian Center worldwide webcast, broadcasting live every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time. Yes, amen, hallelujah. When Spirit Food comes to you, blessings will flow. Say yes. I'm holding in my hand that which I'm holding in my heart. The holy written word of God. The Bible is God speaking to me. I am what the word of God says I am. I can do what the word of God says I can do. I have what the word of God says I possess. I am a believer, not a doubter. Therefore God's word is being confirmed in my life with signs following. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, praise the Lord. Open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. I'm teaching on the title, the subject of how to get your mind right. I know it's a bit relaxed in the title, but it's a wonderful thing to help you remember because when people leave church, they're supposed to be able to repeat what it is they learned, amen? So I'm going to be teaching on the title, How to Get Your Mind Right. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a mess. It just simply means that in order for you to have a successful walk with the Lord, you must be a person who understands the place that your soul has in your life. Or your mind is your soul, your soul is your mind. So if you, it will equate the word mind with the word soul, I'm going to trust with you that this will be of great benefit to you. Now, why would you use the word mind and soul interchangeably? Because we as believers in Christ Jesus, when we accept him as our Savior and our Lord, the scripture says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Now, the part of you that became new is your spirit. Alive, you are now alive unto God spiritually, meaning that you and God are in relationship. God is your father. You're his child. He dwells in you. He lives in you. He's going to communicate and talk with you. But how does a Christian struggle in life after they've already received Jesus as their Lord and Savior? It could be because... Many Christians do not understand the place of their soul or their mind and understand how their body has a part of their function as they walk as Christians. You see, we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live, we, the real you, lives inside of a physical body. Everybody say, I am a spirit. I have a soul, I live in a physical body. So you are a tripartite being. The word tri is the word for three, just like we have tricycles. I don't know if kids still wear, uh, use tricycles and so forth, but nonetheless, a, a tricycle is a three-wheeled vehicle that kids usually ride on. So when we talk about you being a three-part being, you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live inside of a physical body. And when your spirit leaves this physical body, your spirit does not cease to exist, your spirit goes on to live with the Lord because we're in him and he's in us and because we're born again, we have a right relationship with God. So when the body lays down in the dirt or in the grave, that doesn't stop you from being a person who is alive. You're just alive with the Lord. So to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when the question was asked of Jesus, um, 
you know, in the resurrection, whose wife is this woman going to be after seven brothers had her? And they were trying to trip Jesus up as if to say, well, since all of these men had this woman and they, were, they didn't raise up any children to preserve the family name, these people who were asking the question didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the spirit, soul, and body of a person functioning. And so what they were trying to do is trap Jesus as if to say, well, when this woman, she's married to these three brothers, seven brothers, and now she dies finally after the last brother dies, and none of them really raised any children onto the original first brother. So whose wife is she going to be in heaven? And Jesus said, you're in error because you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. That means that we who believe on the Lord, eternal life has begun in us, has started in us, has resided in us the moment we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. You become spiritually alive unto God. So now, the life that I'm required to live as a Christian is to allow him who's on the inside of me to come on the outside. And so therefore, I have found out as a believer in Christ Jesus, because I was six, I was five years old when I accepted the Lord, I found out that I was doing things that I knew in my heart I wasn't pleased with. There were some things that as a Christian, I knew that God wasn't pleased with me doing certain things. And I was wondering, well, why am I doing them even though I'm a Christian? What's going on? Well, I needed to get my, what? mind right. Everybody said you needed to get your mind right. Okay. So when you're getting your mind right, that means that I'm going to have to get my mind, which is not my spirit, but my spirit, which is down on the inside here. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. So the, the real me is down in here. The part of me that got born again and totally became a new creature right down in here. So then what's going on up here in my mind? My mind has to be renewed now. My mind has to be retrained. My mind has to start thinking like God wants me to think. And so if I understand that the real me is in here and my mind is up here and my physical body is out here, then I can begin to focus my attention on the areas that I should develop and grow in. Number one, I want to grow up spiritually, of course. And we know this in scripture, he says, desire this as a newborn babe, desire its mother's milk. So you should desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So we're to grow up spiritually in the Lord but my nature is that of God my nature is that of being is, is as a child of God I'm born of love the love of God has been shed abroad in my heart that's another name for my spirit so what's another name for spirit heart not talking about your blood pump he's talking about your spirit the heart is the center the core of your being your belly region is where you are your, your spirit is not is not your digestive system your spirit is dwelling in this area here. And I used to think about that. I said, why do babies, babies, why are they carried in here? Hmm. That's close to the belly, isn't it? Life comes from the spirit. That's wonderful. So you can influence a child when the child is even in the womb. Anyway, just something to think, think about. But I know this, that because I'm new in here and I can mature and grow up spiritually, I'm also required to grow up mentally, but not at the expense of my spirit, but to grow up mentally in line with my spirit. So I cannot say, well, I believe in Jesus in my heart and I know he dwells in my heart by faith and then turn around and tell people, well, you know what? I'm not sure heaven exists. I'm not sure if Jesus is real. I'm not sure if there's a hell. That don't sound like what you said you've embraced in your heart. Why? Because there are some people that go into seminary. Have you ever heard of a seminary? Seminaries are schools where people learn to be in ministry, but sometimes they should be called cemeteries. <laughs> 
Because a person can go into a seminary full of faith, having Christ, knowing that they have confidence in Christ in their heart, but then go into an institution that tells them, well, you know what? You shouldn't believe this. You shouldn't believe that. You shouldn't believe this. And you shouldn't believe that. And then you find out that the person has less faith when they graduate than they had when they first started. And I've heard of people that if that, that's happened to. And I remember when I was attending Cal State University of Northridge, and my, the, doc, the, 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 the person who was over the religious studies department, that, that was his position. We studied all these world religions, but when it, then when we came to the Bible, he was like, well, I don't believe this, don't believe that, take that out, that's not real, that's this. And I'm like, I have to go to his office and talk to him. And I went to his office and I said, doctor, and I'm not going to use his last name, very popular name. I said, I'm not trying to be a difficult student or anything, but why is it that when we read the, the scriptures and the sacred texts of all these religions around the world, you, you accepted them and you told us to have great respect and reverence for them. We get to the Bible and then you start ripping it to shreds. I said, you're not even treating the Bible as you would the other texts that you told us about. I said, what religion would you, or persuasion are you of? He said, I am a Presbyterian minister. I, he, has a, he had a degree in, from Harvard, Oxford. He had a degree from Yale. This man was educated to the nth degree, but he had no faith. No faith. And consequently, and when I asked him that question, we were riding in the elevator going down, and I said to him, doctor, I said, what, what religion would you, would you actually embrace? And he said, I'd rather be a, a Buddhist. But he told me he was a Presbyterian minister. And I know Presbyterians normally are Christians. Normally. And I came to myself as a college student. I said, this man is confused. I came to that conclusion all on my own. And I also came to this conclusion. I'm not going to pay you to teach me confusion. You're going to have to be consistent. You're going to have to be logical. You're going to have to be a person that, of thought. I'm not going to sit and let you bring confusion to me and tell me that confusion is not confusion. So I came to the conclusion that even though the person is educated, but he's, his mind was educated at the expense of his spirit. And if you're educated correctly, you'll be spiritually educated and mentally educated in line with, with what's happened in your heart as being a new creature in Christ Jesus. So what we're going to be doing is, is going over the importance of getting your mind right. And why do I need to get my mind right? Because the scriptures lets us know that people don't think the way God thinks. So that means we are going to have to learn how to think like God thinks so that we can reflect God in our lifestyle. Now, in my heart, I think like God. I have the mind of Christ in my heart. I mean, I knew that I was doing things as a baby Christian that I, I shouldn't have been doing. And I'm like, I, it bothers me. I got a conscience. Everybody say this, the conscience is the voice of your spirit. So that means when you become a new creature in Christ Jesus, you get a conscience. And these are some things that my conscience won't allow me to do. Now, there's a lot of things my conscience would allow me to do, but some things I was willing to run over. You understand what I mean? And just do it because it's like, hey, 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 you know? But then after I did it, I felt real bad about it. Why was I feeling bad? Because I was a new creature. I had the nature of God on the inside of me and the love of God on the inside of me. And when I walked outside of the boundaries of the love of God, my heart was letting me know, hey, 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 you shouldn't be acting like that. You shouldn't be talking like that. You shouldn't have this attitude toward this person. But see, it felt so good in my flesh. And it seemed like it was the right thing to say when I said it. You know how some people say, well, I just had to just, uh, I had to take the pressure off. You ever say that? Or someone say, well, I just had to let you know how I feel. I just had to give you a piece of my what? Yeah, the only thing was that that mind wasn't too cool. And so Christians have to learn how to actually have the mind 
that will line up with what's going on in the heart. And so when the, the Spirit of God has us, and I know I'm going to get to the Scripture, so some of you may be wondering, well, how long is it taking you to get to the Scripture? I'm just laying a good foundation here. How do you know when you're hearing from God? Well, the Apostle Paul and John and all the other apostles and prophets of Scripture, they didn't write by somebody telling them, you know what, this will make a bestseller. They wrote as they were led by the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit told them what to write and what to say, and they did. And so we who are alive unto God, we who are alive spiritually, when we hear the truth, our spirit registers, that's the truth. That's the truth. That's right. That's right. And if something is not right, your spirit will alert you. Hey, 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 something not right with that. Why? Because the truth already dwells in you. So John said, I'm not writing unto you because you don't know the truth. I'm writing unto you because you do know the truth. And a truth that you have on the inside of you, that truth abides by the power of the Holy Spirit. You're anointed of God. And when you hear the truth, you automatically say, mm, that's the truth. Now, you may not necessarily want to do it. Because your mind will fight you, but one thing for sure, when you hear the truth, you know the truth. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. So it's important for us then as Christians to learn how to allow the truth that's on the inside of us to come forth on the outside. So no one has to convince you of the truth. Nobody has to be like, well, let me introduce the truth to you. No, no. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the what? Truth, and I am the life. That means you have personal, intimate knowledge of the truth and the way and the life. Now, how do you get what's on the inside of you to show up on the outside in your lifestyle and conversation? And so what we're, we're going to look at is the importance of getting your mind right or getting your mind renewed with the word. Now, you're, if you're not there in Isaiah 26 by now, <laughs> You're going to have some real, no, I'm just teasing. Okay. Isaiah 26, are you there? Look at verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Let's all read that out loud together. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. One more time. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Now this is God talking to the the prophet Isaiah but he's talking to all of us and Isaiah was the prophet that was used to pen this verse of scripture but God is saying I'm going to keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee meaning if you keep your mind stayed on me I'm going to keep you in perfect peace and what will happen as you keep your mind trust or stayed on the Lord well what happens is it's easy for your heart to exercise faith because when your mind is scripturally based on what the word says, when your heart says from instruction from God, do this, it's easy for you to do it because your mind says, I can see that. Let's do it. So a person then who is a believer in Christ Jesus but doesn't have their mind renewed with the word of God, they can have some real challenges. God will tell them to do something like, you know, hey, 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 hey I don't think I really want to do that. God is like, You'll really do well if you just follow my instruction. But see, if your mind is not renewed with the word, then your mind will battle with you. And there are thoughts that are shot to your mind from the devil because the devil is called the prince of the power of the air. That means there are thoughts that have come to you that didn't come from here. They didn't come from your spirit. They came from outside of you. But when they come they tell you things that don't line up with the Bible and some people that don't understand the importance of the mind they think you know well well it must be me then that's thinking of that because you know who else would be shooting those thoughts to me well there's a real devil 
And the devil is trying to control your behavior and trying to keep you from getting the benefits of what God has for you because if you don't understand that God's word is designed to, to renew your mind, another way of saying that, remember what King David said? He restoreth my soul. The word mind and soul are the what? Are the same. So when he says, he restoreth my soul, what he means is, hey, God's getting my mind right. And I love the fact that he's getting my mind right. Why? Because when my mind is in line with his word, he'll keep me in what kind of peace? What kind of peace? Perfect. Now see, perfect means mature. You will not lose your mind, but you'll have a right mind. And see, some people that think, well, you are what your mind says. You are what your mind says. Uh-uh. My mind is the tool that my spirit has to educate so that my body can obey what's in my heart. So it's kind of like, well, Dr. Price uses it this way. He says, your mind is the arena of faith. Because you can have God's word in your heart and then you'll think on it and you'll be like, that's right. Thank you, Lord. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And then a contrary thought will come in and try to get you to go away from what you've been told from Scripture. And you know what the Scripture says, but it's like, well, let me think on that. And you start getting into that realm of doubting and then the enemy has kept you from having God's best. Because when a person is double-minded, they cancel out the effectiveness that God has for you if you would just do what his word says. So that's why the devil is trying to what? He's trying to shoot thoughts to your mind. He wants you to think contrary to what God says. Well, Pastor Ziegler, no, if there's no such thing as the devil. If there's no such thing as the devil, then who was tempting Jesus when Jesus came off his 40-day fast? And who was Jesus talking to when he says, ought not this woman being, being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan has bound? If there was no devil, then who was Jesus talking about? Jesus said that the enemy, the thief comes not only but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I've come that you might have life and have life more abundantly. If he wasn't talking about a real devil, who was he talking about? See, the devil will have people think there is no devil. Why? Because if there is no devil, the only person you can blame for the messed up stuff that takes place in life is God. And the devil wants people to blame God for all the bad stuff that's going on. Well, you know, God is in charge of everything. God is over everything. That means, wait a minute, all of these innocent lives, all this messed up stuff that's going on, you're telling me God, God is in charge of that? Oh, you know, God is in, in charge of everything. Well, then he's not doing a very good job. It couldn't be that God is in charge of everything. There has to be that there's a real devil. Because if God was in charge of everything, it means everything that happens is God that's behind it. Well, when you mean to say when Jesus was walking on the water and Peter came to walk with him, that you're telling me that it was God's will for Peter to sink when he looked at the tumultuous water and waves and he cried out to Jesus and said, Jesus, help me. Jesus picked him up and they walked to the ship. And then Peter said, why did I start sinking? Because of your faith. What happened? Peter was looking at the circumstances and the circumstances pulled him away from what Jesus had told him, which was come. And Peter stepped out of the ship and started walking on the word that Jesus said. Jesus said, come, so I'm coming. Jesus said, come, so I'm coming. Jesus said, come, so I'm coming. He's not really walking on the water. He's walking on what God said, which supersedes the waves and the winds. But when he started getting his mind on the circumstances... He started to sink. Now, how do you start to sink? I go swimming all the time. You know what I mean? Sometimes, a lot of times, you don't just start sinking. But see, when he began to be more unrenewed in his mind and un what? And take his heart off of what Jesus said to him, he started to sink. 
which goes to show you that there's a difference. When you start walking by faith on God's word, you're going to get results and get things done that the mind has challenges with. Because your mind is like, I'm used to being in charge. You got to do what I say to do. But see, when you start learning as a believer in Christ Jesus to get your mind renewed with the word and know this, when I'm studying scripture, when I'm on the word of God, I know exactly what I'm doing. I am what? I am brainwashing myself. I know what I'm doing. I intentionally, I acknowledge that. I admit it and I focus on it, I'm washing my mind with the word of God. I know exactly what I'm doing. Some people are like, well, you know, whatever would happen. No, no, no. My mind needs to be renewed. My mind has to be, what, taught to think the way God wants me to think. Now, down in here, it's a, it's a done deal. Done deal. But I gotta get this thing to cooperate. And this thing will, will have thoughts that come against what God says and the devil will try to convince you that you're not what you are. The devil will try to get you to do stuff that's uncharacteristic of being a Christian. You, you know, you're acknowledging, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Hand me another joint, please. Uh, 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 praise the Lord, hallelujah. But I gotta, this person got in my face and disrespected me. I got to take him out. Uh, yeah, praise the Lord, glory to God, hallelujah. But you know what, look at that woman there. She sure is a hammer. Hey, wait a minute, aren't you married? Yeah, but hey, hey, what can I say? See, your brain, your mind, not being renewed with the word of God can take you out. And there are people that are yielding to their brain that's not renewed with the word. When I say the brain, I'm not talking about the physical organ of the brain as much as I want to talk about the spirit of your mind. Your mind can receive thoughts from the spiritual reality of God in your heart and then also your mind can receive thoughts from the devil who's shooting thoughts at your head. And if you start thinking everything that comes to my mind is of God, I'm telling you right now, you, you, you're blowing it. Because everything that comes to your mind is not of God. What is that scripture we're looking at? Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. What's it say? Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. That means you're going to have to put forth some effort to keep your mind stayed on the word of God. The, and, and, that's, and that's work. That's literally work. That means your mind will, will, will have this attitude. Oh, I really don't need to study the Bible. <laughs> well, you know what? You're tired. But you can sit up and watch television for hours on end. You can do all kinds of things that require exercising of discipline and strength and do all these things in a day's time. Days go by quickly. Weeks go by, months go by, years can go by, and a person can go without their mind being renewed with the Word of God. And then they wonder why they don't have any peace. Well, I'm a Christian. If I die right now, I go to be with God in heaven. Yeah, but you're living a jacked up life and you are messed up mentally. Well, you know, I just, God helped my mind. He gave us the prescription for getting your mind right. How do you get your mind right? Keep your mind what? Stayed on him. Well, how do you do that? Turn over to Romans chapter 12. Romans the 12th chapter. See, when you come to church, you got, you're learning how to cooperate with God, how to receive from God so you can have results, so you can walk on water, so you can speak to the mountain and it will obey you, so you can speak to the sycamine tree and, the, and, and have the power of God actually manifest in your life. Why be supernatural and not have any supernatural manifestations? Are you listening to me? Why have a, 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 the Savior that's risen from the dead that is alive and well and not have his ability of life in your life? You might as well just be religious. Religions believe in idols, and they, idols don't see, they don't talk, they don't hear, they don't respond. So why would you be a Christian and be religious? You have a living Savior. You have a living God. But you've got to be willing to help him to help you. As Cuba Gooding said in whatever his, what was the name of that thing? Jerry Maguire. Help me help you. Okay, I'm just being ridiculous, but 
Okay. You're there in Romans chapter 12? Paul the apostle says this. I beseech you. That word beseech means I'm begging you. I implore you. I desire greatly. I beseech you therefore brethren. So he's not talking to what? He's not talking to sinners. He's not talking about the people outside of the body of Christ. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to believers. He says, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. See, your mind is where you reason things out, correct? So he says here, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. Now, when he says this world, he's not telling you to look like a globe. He's talking about the aspects of how the world functions. This, the devil has his people functioning a certain way. And you know what he's talking about here because you was once the devil's people. I was once the devil's people. Somebody said, well, Pastor, you don't understand. Are you kidding me? I was a character too. I knew something was going on. What's making me do wrong when I was a little kid? Why am I getting in trouble? Because I had the what? The spirit of disobedience functioning in my life. And then when I accepted Jesus, I had Jesus in my heart, but my mind was still unrenewed and being unrenewed in my mind, I still have habits that I was playing out that didn't agree with my heart. It didn't give me peace in my heart. I knew my mother and father were right, but I was doing stuff because I was listening to the spirit of disobedience, even though I shouldn't have been. See, some of you don't know anything about this, so if you, you, you're perfect. You've never made any mistakes. You've never blown it. You've never been obedient to the devil. You just go ahead right now, raise your hand so we can pray for you and know that you're a liar, and we'll cast that lying demon out of you. All of us have tripped because we were all, the Bible says, born in sin and conceived in iniquity. We all tripped. So, well, Pastor Ziegler, you don't know what I'm dealing with. Uh, uh, Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet he was without sin. Tempted in all points means there was nothing left out. But he didn't sin. He knew what was going on. And so the Bible lets us know as brethren, as sisters in the Lord, then he tells us, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you get transformed? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, you know, we've raised four children. Now we have two grandchildren that we are involved in, in their lives. And my grandson loved, when he was coming through his younger age, he's now six, but this is, you know, he's never asked us to get a transformer lately. But he used to be into the transformer cars. Y'all ever know anything about transformers? You've been what? It's a song that they had. You've been synthesized, right? Transformers, is that what it was? Is that what it said? A what? Oh, I thought it was synthesized. Excuse me. See, that goes to show you how I got to listen. I got to listen a little more intently. Thank God for being the ability to read. You a transformers, robots in disguise. I thought it was you've been synthesized. <laughs> okay, so it would it would it, it does make more sense. And how do you know about that? You still playing with your transformers? <laughs> All right. So, the, but the point is, is that this thing that looks like a car, you can manipulate it and open it up, and it stands up like a robot. And then you can take it and manipulate it, and it's a car again. So even though it's a car, it's a robot. So if you were just playing with it and looking at it as a car, you'd be like, man, it's a pretty cool looking car. You didn't know that it could stretch out and manipulate into a robot. See, some people look at you and they're like, you're just a regular person. You're just like us. That's what the world thinks. Oh, shut up, old Christian. Don't be talking to me about the Bible. <laughs> we just use the Bible to have the president to swear in on. 
We just use the Bible and God we trust and swear in on this and when you go to court. But as far as the Bible being taught in school, ha, we're not trying to have that and don't be quoting scriptures on television and before the screen. And so you don't be singing about the Bible. See, the world wants the Christian, shut up and be quiet, just sit in the back. That's their attitude. The devil has no love for us. And so we have to, we have to be what? Transformed in our actions. Robots in disguise. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. That's hot off the press. Hot off the press. So, so here we are learning now how to allow him who's on the inside of us to what? Show up on the outside. And the way that we do that, allow the robot on the inside of us, if I can use that expression without being sacrilegious, but if we can, if we can allow him who's on the inside of us to show up on the outside, we're going to have to be what? Renewed in our thinking. That means we have to put forth some genuine effort. You're there in Romans chapter 12 there again, right? One and two. Let's, you follow along as I read it out loud. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, what do you mean I have to present my body as a living sacrifice? God, why don't you just do with my body what you want to do? God's like, nah, it don't work like that. The way it works is I own your body. God is talking. I own your body, but you're the steward of your body. Now, since you're the steward of your body, that means the caretaker of that body, offer your body unto me as a living sacrifice. Oh, well, God, I'm willing to die for you. I'll die for you, Jesus. I oh, was just like the person that came to fight with General Patton. The soldier came to him and said, you're the most winning general. Oh, General Patton, I just want to fight on your team. I'm not afraid to die for my country. I know that you win because you've got extraordinary, you know, abilities as a general. I'm willing to to fight on your team. Please, General Patton, let me fight with your team. I'm willing to die for my country. He said, no, I have no need for you. Uh, then you can leave. The guy says, no, no, I'm willing, to, I'm willing to die for my country. I'm not afraid of death. He says, did you hear me, young man? You genuinely need to leave. And the young man said, but why do you want me to leave? Why do you want me to leave? I really am not afraid to die. I'm willing to die for my country. He said, that's the problem. The way to win a war is you let the enemy die for his country, and you live. I need soldiers that will live, not are willing to die. You let the enemy die, and you win, and keep on living. Huge and profound in understanding. Yes. So notice what he said. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a, a what? A living sacrifice. There's a whole lot of Christians that say, well, I'll serve God eventually when I die. They, oh, no, 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 no. He wants you to serve him. Give your body over to him. I said, give your body, which belongs to him anyway. Give your body that you are a steward over you give it to him as what kind of sacrifice? A living sacrifice. Holy. Oh, boy, you need to shut up, pastor. You're just talking a little bit too much. You get up in my business. Well, that's because God's business is you. And I used to do stuff that I knew that I needed to get right. Now, I knew I was right in my heart. I knew if I died, I was going to be with God in heaven. I had no doubt about that since I was five years of age. But there was some stuff I was trying to hold on to and do that I knew I needed to let go of. Well, God, take it from me. God said, I ain't taking nothing from you. Hmm. Now, some people are like, you sure are sounding like God has no love for us. No, no. He gave you the new nature. And if you allow the new nature on the inside of you to what? Express on the outside and you be transformed. How do I do that, Lord? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, which is your what? Which is your reasonable service. Reasonable. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ah, so you're telling me I got to do something. 
Well, God, I don't like it when I have to do something. I just want you to do it. God is like, you ain't punking me like that. See, some people just try to punk God out. Everything that happens is God. Everything that happens is God. God is like, uh-uh, no, no, no. You're going to have to put in the work. See, that's the reason why I don't like to come to spirit food, because you try to make me responsible. <laughs> so you can go somewhere and let somebody else try to give you some funny tasting Kool-Aid. And some of you don't even know anything about that funny tasting Kool-Aid. What was the name of that group, babe? Jim Jones. Got Jonestown. Got people in the jungle drinking, what was it? Cyanide Kool-Aid, all of them dead. There was something trying to get away from him. He was killing them. Talking about we're going to serve God. How are you going to serve God killing people like that? And trying to get people to kill themselves. Notice he said, offer up your body as a living sacrifice. See, if you stay with the word, you can't get involved in a cult. You'll be safe from all cults. Why? Because the word of God is the truth. And if you walk in line with the truth, you can be in perfect peace. And that's important. Now, I don't know why some people came to Jesus. I came to Jesus to have perfect peace. I want to have peace with God and favor with man. I wanted my life to be successful. And you know what? I found out that the only instruction that there is in the planet that will help me, that makes me able to enjoy life with God and with man, is the Bible. And when I find that people have issues with the Bible, I'm like, uh-huh, now I know who I'm dealing with. And be not conformed, verse 2 of Romans chapter 12, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and what? Acceptable and what? Perfect will of God. Now, what if a person does not get their mind renewed? Then if they don't re get their mind renewed with the word, we know they won't be in perfect peace. And what else? They won't know what is the good acceptable and perfect will of God. That means they'll be running around all confused. Christians running around confused. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Oh, I don't know what to do. What, to, what am I supposed to do? I don't know what to do. Turn over to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians the fourth chapter. Now I'm not putting anybody down, but Christians ought not be confused. Because God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. When you go to church, you ought to be hearing something that causes you to have peace. You ought to be maturing in the peace of God. You ought to be able to say, I sure was some good eating there. Ah, I enjoyed that food, that spirit food. Now, I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about the word of God is food for your spirit. I just happen to just... Follow in line with I believe would help you to remember that. That's why I wear a chef's smock. And the name of the church is called Spirit Food because the Lord told me what to call the church. But I trust that when you think about what you're doing when you hear the word, you're feeding your spirit. You're growing up spiritually and you're getting your mind renewed with the word of God. That's really, really important. <clears throat> Some people are like, well, you know, I don't, I don't really need that consistently. But I have news for you. How often do you eat regular meals? And how would you be if you treated your, your natural meal service like your spiritual meal service? Some people, they feed their spirit one cold snack a week and try to get all this stuff done. And they feed their physical bodies three square meals a day. The reason they feed their bodies three square meals a day, <clears throat> Pastor, because it's important for me to be able to have strength. Well, how do you think you're going to have spiritual strength when you're starving your spirit? All right, I'm just going to drop the Bible. What is it? Drop the mic. Drop the mic and go on home. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. All right, but it, there is reality to that, right? Yes. Philippians chapter 4, are you there? Yes. All right, <clears throat> verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. 
Be careful for nothing. Now that word be careful is the word be anxious. Don't be anxious for anything. Don't be filled with anxiety about anything. Don't let worry and anxiety be on you and in you about anything. So be careful for nothing is what? Don't be anxious. Don't be filled with anxiety about anything. <clears throat> but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts. What's another name for heart? Your spirit. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall guard or, that's the word for keep, <clears throat> shall guard or keep your hearts, which is your spirit, and what else? And mine through through Christ Jesus. Through who? Christ Jesus. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, what does he say do? Think on these things. Think on these things. Now why would I think on these things? <clears throat> because he says it'll guard my heart and my mind. And what is it, what is it that meets all this criteria? What do you know of that is true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, and filled with virtue, and praiseworthy? What is that that meets all that criteria? The Word of God. That's the only thing I know of that meets all of this. Somebody says, well, let me tell you the truth, but it's not praiseworthy. Well, let me share this with you, because one person said to me, I mean, they were known to be a prophetess. And they said, I'll never say anything behind your back I wouldn't tell you in your face. What that means is I'm going to rip you in your face and I'm going to rip you behind your back. And I'm bold enough to tell you that. And I'm thinking, that don't, there's nothing praiseworthy about that. There's nothing good about that. I won't say nothing behind your back. I won't say in your face. So what is godly about that? And see, some people try to change scripture to, to gratify the flesh and not do what they're supposed to do. You need to get your mind right. Because that same person said to me, <clears throat> they said, I've been watching you for a while. This is when I was an assistant pastor years ago, working with a, <clears throat> a wonderful, wonderful ministry. And they said, I noticed you don't get into any trouble. I said, the Bible says, study to be quiet and mind your own business. You know, some people don't really like to hear it. They, they, they don't mind you being about the Bible, but they don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. Isn't that interesting? Well, why you got to quote scripture to me? Because that's how you maintain the anointing of God in your life. That's how you are able to walk on waters and speak to mountains and do the things that need to be done. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Why? Because if my mouth is filled with God's word that's in my heart and my mind's renewed with the word so that when I speak, it's God's word that comes out, then it doesn't surprise me at all that I get results. I live in the same world you live in. Same planet. Same country, same neighborhoods, same economics that you have to deal with. But why is my life constantly increasing? It's constantly at peace. Constantly, I'm winning all the time. Why is that happening? Oh, that's because you're just so handsome. I, I thank you very much, but I can't say that I'm responsible for all that. That's the Lord. And you are lovely and handsome yourself. So then what is it, Pastor? I need you to pray with me because if you don't pray with me, I'm not going to get results. Well, what makes me so special? I put on my pants just like you put on your pants. I have to deal with the same things in life that you have to deal with. Everything you're facing, I'm facing too. So why is it you're winning? 
Could it be that I'm taking time to get my mind right? I'm putting forth effort to get my mind right, to keep my mind right, to be what? To be at perfect peace, because if you keep your mind stayed on me, I'll keep you at perfect peace. And you know what helps me to stay in perfect peace? When I follow the instructions that I've set up about being on time. So I have to quit, because I've run out of time. <laughs> but we're gonna be teaching on this, how to get your mind right. Stay on the word, amen? All right, praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord thanksgiving. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We love you for giving us this time. I want in the to thank world. you for tuning in today's lesson. If you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then I'm going to lead you into a confession of faith. If you say these words after me, you can become a child of the living God. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let us pray these words now, believing these words in our heart and saying them with our mouth. Dear God, I believe in my heart you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. He was crucified. His blood was shed to wash me clean. And dear God, you raised him from the dead. So I confess with my mouth, now Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. You are alive. I believe this in my heart. And because I confess you as my Lord, I am now a child of the living God. Father, thank you for making me your very own. I will live for you. you are in Jesus' name, amen. That never goes I'd like to thank you for your continual support of this broadcast of Spirit Food Christian Center. We're so grateful for your participation. I'd like to give you an opportunity to participate by our Push Pay app. Text my SFCC to the number 77977. You'll receive further instruction on how to give. We're so grateful and thankful for your continual support and love. Remember, you're helping to make it happen. In Jesus' name, you amen. Are the sun.